you think you could really trust a bank that you cannot see, that you can't walk into? Well, that's what millions of millennials are doing by signing up to a new club of European smartphone-based banks. With traditional bricks and mortar banks struggling to compete with this innovative technology, will banking become purely digital? Welcome, very warm welcome to Roundtable with me, David Foster. Look, many of us move our money around through an online website or through an app on our phones. But if you've signed up to one of these new digital banks, you no longer have the option of walking into a bank for a chat if there's a bank there. And that's just how millions of people like it. Banking has moved from the high street to our smartphones. Digital app-based banks such as the UK's Monzo, Germany's N26 and Sweden's Klarna are shaking up the foundations of mainstream finance. Millions of millennials have been won over by real-time money management tools. In 2017, a World FinTech report stated they are widely regarded as influential customers of the future and offer higher revenue potential. Digital banking is already thriving in parts of Africa and Asia. Will these European fintech banks come to dominate Western finance? So let the conversation begin because joining us via Skype from Washington DC, we have Diego Zuluaga, policy analyst at the Center for Monetary and Financial Services, who may tell us about the risks, if there are any. With me at the round table, we have the editor of the fintech website, Tanya Andreasian, Principal Product Manager at the UK Digital Bank Tandem. Here, Andre Yusfin and Santosh Kumar, the Head of Innovation at HCL Technologies. And I think we'll get into this in a moment, Santosh. It, yeah. It's a software company that helps the big banks work out where they should be going in terms of the digital age as much as anything. That's right. OK. Um, Tanya, let me ask you this first of all. The question was asked in that little piece we had just then. Will digital banks dominate? What do you think? It's a very good question, and uh, nobody has a crystal ball. However, I think personally they will not. And also, how do you define a digital bank? Because quite a lot of big banks like Citi and Barclays and Deutsche Bank and the rest also launch in digital subsidiaries or digital standalone businesses. So what is a digital bank? However, whether digital banking will become a prevailing uh, mode of service, yes, it will. OK, define a digital bank, Andrea, if you can. Uh, I think a digital bank is anything that provides uh, digital services. I think the traditional concept of a bank, which is simply something that holds your money and lets you transact, is becoming more diverse and interesting. We're seeing very different behaviours amongst customers, where they used to have all of their banking within one house. Now you might have one bank that handles your bills and your salary, another one where you squirrel away your money, another one where you might use to pay for Uber and beer and that sort of stuff. Uh, and actually, there's a lot more behaviours and a lot more opportunity to grab specific sections of those behaviours. OK, let me get this out of my pocket. It doesn't normally leave my side, but it is my wallet. And in here, I have some Turkish, I have some pounds, sterling, and I have some euros. All in cash. Real money, folding, as they call it, in some parts of London. Do you ever see at your bank any of that? Uh, money that you can put in a washing machine and lose and tear and forget. Uh, no, we don't really, and we're seeing a big decline in the use of cash. Hey, plastic money is okay to wash nowadays in the UK, Actually, right? Actually, two of those <laughs> notes are the £10 and the £5 British notes. Yeah, you can put them in the washing machine, but they're probably not worth that much more when they come out. Um, in terms of laundering your own money, that is. Uh, so, digital banks are the same as ordinary banks these days, or not? What else do they offer? I think they're starting to offer a lot more... Um, interesting services and fast developing services. If you look at the likes of, well, us and maybe other services like Moneybox, you're starting to see banks that will automatically squirrel away money and save money without you ever having to think about it. We're offering you the ability to compare your credit card bills against the other balances that you actually know how much you can pay off with your credit card bills. And these are all things that are a function of how quickly we've been able to develop based on what we're seeing in uh, customers' behaviour. So, Santosh, th there shouldn't be any problem in trying to, to, to keep up with these people, if not compete, because it's offering exactly the same services. It, it uh, takes money, it lends money, it takes risks. Yep. Um, 
Yeah, so there is no difference. There is no difference. So I think from a, if you look at from a large bank as uh, you know, we, we heard already, that a number of large banks are also doing this digital uh, bank in a way, right? I mean, so you look at from a customer experience perspective, and see these experiences about customer journeys, understanding what uh, these customers' journeys are, and uh, as my friend Antti has alluded to, that understanding that how their spends are, how the behaviors is going to be. So the large banks are also doing the same thing, in my opinion. Already, I mean, if you look at whether Lloyd's or if you look at Barclays here, or, or you know, in, uh, if you look at Singapore, which is a DBS, Development Bank of Singapore, probably one of the fastest growing leading uh, digital bank in, in the world. So, I mean, there's not much of a difference in, in that sense. Let me ask um, Diego. Oh, yeah, you did <laughs> Sorry. In. Diego, we'll come to you in just a sec. <laughs> Sorry, just wanted to jump in uh, please, regarding please. the wallet that you had on the table. I'll put it yet. back in my pocket so, yes. now. Because <laughs> uh, you're all banking <laughs> types and I know what you do with <laughs> other people's money. <laughs> Good. Talking about digital banks and purely digital nowadays, quite a lot of digital banks are moving into the offline world. Like, for example, Starlin, one of the startup banks, now partnered with, po with the post office. So if you want to deposit cash, take it out of your wallet and put it into your digital account, you can do it physically at the post office branch. Which is good because there's less cash. And uh, also Monzo, if I'm not mistaken, now accepts cash via um, retailers that have PayPoint. Um, connections. Okay, so, so that would cater to the older generation who happen to have cash or get paid in cash for whatever reason. They, they, they would still be able to use it. I'll ask you more about that in a moment. But Diego, Diego, the risks, what are, are the risks? But let, me, let me give you an example. Yesterday, in preparation for this program, I signed up to a digital bank. Um, I'm not going to tell anybody which one it was. It took me less than five minutes. They have now got a picture of my driving license. They've now got a video from me because there had to be a greeting and uh, they've got my name my address and bang that's it am i entering into dangerous territory because they've given me an account number already well i'd say that you're entering into no more dangerous territory than you would by handing that data to anybody else because the data protection regime now is very similar for uh, a lot of customer facing businesses and banks have been having to deal with data protection for many years now and indeed they spend enormous amounts of money hundreds of millions of pounds every year uh, trying to protect customer data from hacks and there's a tremendous political backlash every time uh, anything happens that might compromise customer data so i think to the extent that the practices are similar across uh, the different firms and particularly between startups and established firms. I don't think there's anything to worry about on top of that. What you see is that a lot of these app-based firms and smaller online banks um, are using third-party providers to protect their data. The likes of Amazon, AWS, IBM and so on. And these are specialists at holding customer data and protecting it from uh, unauthorized access. So I think to that extent, we're seeing a very healthy division of labor. Well, we'll ask Andre in just a moment whether that is the case with, with, with your bank. But I want to know, do you think there is no more risk with a traditional high street bank um, and a digital bank as long as they are well run? And they're protected, aren't they? Well, the different kinds of risks, right? If we think back maybe 100, 150 years, your bank with its physical branch was at the risk of being robbed by a group of uh, evil people who might come in and take all the cash with them. And the fact that you had small banks that were undiversified, that didn't have the possibility of insurance uh, that we have today, that uh, put a lot of people's funds in danger. Now what we face is an online threat, and I think we're adapting to it. I don't think necessarily that means we will have no events of adverse outcomes, but it is evident that there's a lot of innovation happening in this space. And the more competition we get, the more quickly we will arrive at the right outcome, which is data protection at the same time as you have quality services and cheap financial services for the broad population. I'd even say, that there, was, I'd even say there was less risk. I think the uh, most vulnerable point in a lot of banks is actually the people that work there. So namely people in contact centers and people in branches. And actually I personally have been the victim of risk where a fraudster managed to uh, find my address, steal my post, uh, then use that post to call up and pretend to be me, have new cards order, etc. and uh, basically get at all my accounts. Now, given that the bank that you signed up for has both uh, a picture of your face, they've got the location of your phone, so they know that it's actually you that's probably looking at a bank statement. They know it's you looking at a bank statement because of the video that you have on your phone. And actually that can be a much more secure way of accessing your banking information and uh, doing banking transactions than 
by interacting with you. How many real people are there for your customers to interact with at, at your bank? So we have a, a contact support centre within our office. Uh, we're looking to expand it. It's relatively small right now. and. So, so there are real people yes. that real people can relate to? Absolutely. Okay, because well, that's very important. Yeah, yeah. Right? You can't, you can't have just digital, only digital. Yeah. What if, yeah. if something happens, if you lose your phone, I don't know, if your app doesn't work, or if you have any questions, you've got to talk to somebody. You can't talk to the chatbot for something that is beyond just basic stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So you need yeah. either uh, people in the contact centre or perhaps maybe partnerships with the uh, retails or, or yeah. some other organisations where you can walk into somewhere mm -hmm. where you can talk to somebody either face to face or some other way. We've got real people, we actually got real people supported by uh, natural language processing, machine learning kind of algorithms that will look at conversations and chats and letters coming in and help to sort that and help to manage that in a way that's much more efficient than a lot of It doesn't sound like real banks. people. Well, the, the real people are still there answering the questions, but they can be much more efficient because the questions are directed exactly to the person best place to answer them. Uh, which is why if we can I, operate can with such a comment. small... Yeah, Diego um, and Santos, I'm not ignoring you, yeah, I promise yeah, sure. you. He's, just, he's just interrupted, which is one of the rules you can interrupt in this <laughs> programme. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add to what was said. I, I, I agree. And, and I think one of the interesting things that we will see develop over the next few years is that people will look for an app that will serve them well 95% of the time, but also customer service that's personalised for the 5% of occasions when things do go wrong. For a long time, of course, uh, people complain that neither the internet banking or the mobile banking experience with the legacy banks was very good, nor was the customer service particularly effective. And I think one of the things that um, particularly app-based services are grappling with is, as well as helping people well 95% of the time via a good program interface and good automated services and so on, having the, cap the capability to deal with that 5% of, of events in which people are looking for more than just the standard procedure. And is this something, Santos, I'll ask you this question, you may have something else that you want to say as well, mm -hmm. but is this something that um, the high street banks, let's call them that, mm -hmm. yeah, um, are, are concerned about and looking into? The fact that people don't want to lose the, the, mm -hmm. the customer mm -hmm. um, bank face-to-face -face relationship, mm -hmm. but they know that they've got to move on. Yeah. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll just have to <coughs> take the question in two parts. I mean, one of the things is that I believe that not all the products are available on, on mobile banks. So if you look at the mortgage, for example, I mean, I, as a customer, I've seen that people want to have that engaging experience going into the branch and having a chat with somebody and say, I want to have a mortgage, what is it, and what is the process, and so on and so forth. While you can use the mobile application to process applications and so on, but you still need, you know, an advisory. I mean, so there is a personal, uh, as, I, as Diego mentioned about the personalized treatment, I think that is certainly uh, an element that high street banks still hold. And there is, a, there is a value in it. And I agree that the customer experience was not that great in past. And that's where the technology is now enabling the, the larger banks as well to move fast and, and, and be in the right side of, uh, you know, uh, with the startup banks as well in providing the best customer experience. So, and, and the second part of it is, you know, if you look at uh, from a data security point of view, they have been using the data and securely for a large number of years. So the, that aspect of it is being there. I mean, of course, there is a case of, you know, threat that's, you know, uh, you mentioned about, but that existed, you know, and it, today as well, and it, it, in past and today as well, and with the small, smaller, smaller banks, it is still continues to exist. So it's not going away mm -hmm. that cyber threat is still there. Tony, l let me ask you this. Um, the sort of technology that we're seeing at the moment is obviously being refined day by day, but we have had the internet for, well, best part of a generation, generation and a half. Your banking magazine um, has been around since the 1980s. Why are we suddenly seeing this, this spurred? What has changed? Well, uh, the internet has been around, yes, but the mobile phones were not as sophisticated and also the online security, cyber security, as well as different capabilities uh, such as cloud or other technologies were nowhere near the sophistication and the security they are today. Plus, uh, the regulator has recently in the UK relaxed rules in terms of barriers to entry for new challenger banks. And that spurred them along. This and is of the course, main reason, is it? And that spurred them along. And open banking and the PSD2 regulation that uh, came into the UK and Europe. What do you call that one? PSD2, so Payment Services Directive. Yep. It's a new regulation that came into effect um, earlier in January this year. 
So all that spurred the competition, their uh, capabilities for the smaller players to enter and to really make their mark yep. and say, hey, hey, here we are, and actually start offering services. Uh, and ultimately, that became um, a, a much more variety for the consumer. And uh, it kind of it's snowballing, right? It's nowhere uh, near the size it is yet. Obviously, Challenger Bank's much smaller, yeah. but... And one of the differences with today is that it's moving into the more educated, more urban market, whereas it was initially extremely popular in developing countries in Africa and, and in Asia because the people there in remote areas had no other means. Exactly, yet. exactly. They couldn't go to a bank. Exactly, and that's a, comp that's a completely different market and they're serving a completely different purpose and the mobile uh, services are used in a different way uh, and targeted at different type of transactions and different type of services. So in the developed world, if you look at the Scandinavian markets, for example, they haven't had checks, for instance, that we still write here today. They haven't had them for decades. And look, they're fine in terms of their mobile development. They are way ahead. If you look at the sum of the Scandinavian banks, like Icelandic banks, like Orion Bank, for example, or DNB, uh, even Nordea. Not you know, necessarily the Icelandic bank, though. Uh, no, no, the, the <coughs> banks in Iceland. That I don't know that. Yeah, turbulent yes, time. yes, the little banks. I'm not. Yeah, they're yeah. like literally like a couple of banks left in Iceland. But in I, terms, I, th I think yeah. one key reason. If so, sorry to interrupt, um, sure. but I think one. Don't key worry, you're getting good at it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one key reason that um, some of the developing countries have been able to leapfrog, to leapfrog developed markets is that they don't have the same burden of regulation that developed markets have. So people don't realize, but one of the reasons we have so little differentiation among the incumbent banks and the products that they offer and the kind of experiences that customers can have is the fact that products have been standardized by regulation. Sometimes the intentions for that are good. They want to make it easy for people to compare and shop around and switch, yeah. but it can also lead to a market that looks very much the same. And one of the opportunities from this digital banking revolution is that as a result of specialist banks emerging, we can have, as was pointed out just now, we can have more variety and more choice that is more relevant to the consumer. At the end of so the that day, though, don't feel helpless. Yeah, Andre, it comes down to trust, doesn't it? Initially, once you've done something for a period of time, people will recognise that you can do it. Then, then other people will, will trust you. So, how do you set out initially to say, "Give me your millions"? I'm new to this, but I, I've got a good idea. How do you set out to do that? Well, for people one, are also investing in your banks as well as lending you their money? I should certainly hope so. Uh, for one, we're covered by the same regulation as the larger banks. So you've got the same guarantee for your money that you do with the other banks. Um, we, we Exactly the same way as Barclays, if you put your money there and you put your money in tandem, it is still guaranteed by the UK. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is that we're not actually asking customers, initially at least, to put all of their money from their current accounts towards Tandem. What we're saying is, well, if you're having trouble saving, for example, why don't you start saving a little bit with Tandem? Uh, why don't you put a little bit of money away towards uh, your Christmas present, your bicycle, your holiday? Because one of your selling points is that you will identify where people's spending habits are taking them, and if they're spending too much, let's say, on their water bill, uh, you might be able to suggest that they do something a little bit different. Correct. Go to this, this particular provider or go and find out a little bit more about the, that. What, what about if, if, if I'm spending too much on my on my water bill, and you send me to a product that recognizes that I'm having more baths because I'm a farmer and I'm getting dirtier, and it puts me in touch with a, a, a thousand different cleaning products that I don't want or I'm not interested in. How, how do you make sure that people are happy with where you send them? So I, I think um, that's certainly somewhere where we started and we still do offer that service, but the way that that data has taken us has actually shown us some much more interesting avenues specifically around saving. So what we'll do is we'll be able to automatically detect how much you're earning. We'll see what all of your regular bills are, including your weekly bath bill, which hopefully is not too large. Uh, and we'll identify the difference between all your regular payments and your regular income. And we'll say, OK, actually, we think here's how much you've got to play with. And then you've got a few choices. You can either put that to your savings, or you can put that towards more luxurious but bathing oils. Uh, and we'll actually suggest, okay, here's how much we think you can save safely this week, and we'll do that for you automatically. I know it was a, I know it was a daft idea, but <laughs> a, a more, more sensible. Well, I just wanted to know, you know, in terms of privacy, you know, you identify the things that people want or need, or perhaps don't want and don't mm -hmm. need. What about interest rates? How do you compare to Santosh? I'll come to you in just a moment and talk about your clients' intentions. We're better, but, frankly, um, because we have a much, much lower cost base than uh, all of the traditional banks. We can afford to offer much better interest rates on our 
uh, savings accounts and also on Do you recognize this as an independent observer of it all? Uh, the, that's true. Quite a lot of challenger banks do offer better rates, but they are not forever better rates. So after a while, they do kind of tend to somewhat lower them or change the, um, the rules a little so bit. That's a bit like putting but the candy bars little, next to the, the till a, in the A little um, bit, yes. The but there are different, checkout. I mean, you've got to attract uh, customers Get somehow, it. right? There, you have to yeah. try different avenues of doing that. So different challenger banks and different newer banks have different strategies. So, you know, I'm not suggesting Tandem is, for example, the same as Monzo and the same as Starlin, etc. They all have their own sort of marketing yeah. and product development strategies. But, uh, yeah. Andre, you told me before the program that you didn't see um, other banks, you mentioned Monzo mm -hmm. and, and other banks in the same line, the challenger banks, as your competition. You saw the big banks yep. as your competition. So, Santosh, you are here representing, if you like, the, the big banks. I know you don't work directly for them. Do you see them as your competition or do your customers see them as, as the real competition rather than other banks that they might find on, on the same street as themselves? So I think that's a very interesting question. So if you look at uh, from a large bank's perspective, obviously they hold a large set of customers. So their strength lies in holding the large number of clients and the large number of products that they are currently engaging with. Now, when you look at the startup banks, the challenger banks, and most of these banks are offering uh, services, as I said, that are very relevant for the younger generation and potentially a lot of people are signing up using social media and all of the other yeah. influences, right? Now, not just uh, young people, by yes. the way. I did it yesterday. Uh, you're, you're not. You're, young. you're very young. I mean, it's like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> you see my fishing rod. I'm out for compliments. <laughs> so I think the, if you look at these, still the you know uh, different age groups, and you will still feel that there is a large segment of uh, people who are uh, still comfortable with dealing with a large bank. But, but I'm sorry, t time sure. is of the essence here. Yeah. You, if you see them, or if your clients see them as the competition, yeah. so, what are yes. they going to do about it? Yeah. Are they going to compete and try and up their yeah. game, or are they going to buy them out, swallow so, them up? So definitely, the trend is that they are launching their own digital uh, branches. So for example, if you look at ING, they have come up with their own uh, bank, which is now a digital branch. If you look at BBS in, in, in there, if you look at Commonwealth Bank of Australia, they have all done the same thing. They've all enhanced the digital play. They are going to the market and providing the same services, similar kind of experience as a, as a challenger bank would do. So they are seeing them as a threat, definitely. And you know what sometimes people do with threats? They extinguish them by buying them up. Buy them. Is that a possibility? So that's a possibility. That's a certainly a possibility. Yeah. And uh, we have seen that, you know, for example, Fedor Bank was there. I mean, that was, uh, you know, taken over. And then, you know, there are multiple other examples they, that... We'll they, they're getting divorced okay. now. They're divorced so again so now. <laughs> Diego, do you see a time in the future when those people that Santosh represents will take a step back and say, OK, people like Andre and Tandem and, and other challenger banks, well, they're getting too big for their boots. I'll tell you what we'll do is we, we've got billions here. We'll go out and buy them and we'll, we'll make Andre here a multi-millionaire. He'll be happy. We're happy. The customer's happy. Or is there room out there for everybody? I think there will be some digital banks that will grow so fast that it will be very difficult for anyone to offer an attractive amount. But in terms of, if you think about taking incumbents and helping them to learn the best new practices and overcome some of the legacy issues that they have, I think buying up some of the disruptors is a great way to go about it because you instantly get the human capital to do it. You start out, as Santos was just saying, with a very large customer base, so you can apply it selectively and offer different ranges of products to different people. And that combined with this reform that was mentioned earlier, the open banking uh, changes, means that people are going to have a very quick ability to realize whether things are good for them or not and an ability to switch. So I think in that context, uh, big banks acquiring the, the new players, or some of them at least, uh, is, is going to be a good thing. But okay. that doesn't mean that there won't be major competition from some of these digital banks. Andrew, I'm going to come to you in just a minute because I want you to help round off the program. But Tanya, I want you to tell me where you see the future in five years' time. Oh, in terms of digital banking? In terms banking. of all of this, all of this digital and traditional banking. I think that traditional banking will remain in five years' time is not long enough to get rid of it. <coughs> there still be services that, as uh, the p fellow panelists mentioned, cannot be addressed purely online. So mm. people would like to s come in and talk to somebody. So, but this will not, the branches will not be transactional. They more going to be um, like um, consultancy centers, if you so to speak, whilst digital banking will be more and more prevalent. Uh, most of the big guys will be just as sophisticated. We don't have very long. We're going to 
do a transaction here. Santosh, <laughs> there, there's my wallet. Yep. Okay. In a year or so's time, you think the best thing to do is, is to buy Andre out. Okay. You've got it sitting there. Andre, do you want to be a trailblazer for the future or do you want to retire to your villa in the south of France, selling up your company, making millions and watching the high street banks carry on in their merry way? I think there's only really one answer to that, isn't there? I would much rather be a trailblazer. Yeah? Mm. You don't see a time when one day you could say, look, the money's incredibly attractive. Actually, we deal in money. That, that, that's our job. The money's incredibly attractive. We've had a good idea. Let's let them get on with it. Uh, not for the foreseeable. I think there's too much opportunity for growth, innovation, and interesting problems. OK, Santosh, I can have that back then. <laughs> <laughs> Let's Very get hard. back together in five years' time and see how, how it goes. Let's do that. <laughs> a man with principle, a banker with principle. You won't see this again on this programme. Thank you for coming awesome. on. Thank you. For, good luck with what you're doing thank and you. equally to you. Uh, Tanya, thank you very much indeed. It must be a fascinating time to be, to be looking at all of that. And thank you once again. Second time we've had you on the programme, Diego, from Washington, D.C., very early in the morning there. We thank you for joining us. From me, David Foster, uh, from the rest of the team, thank you for watching. We hope to have you next time. It's going back in my pocket. Goodbye for now. <laughs>